so welcome at the third webinar of the series uh, uh, on the NEANIAS Space Services uh, developed in the framework of the H2020 NEANIAS project. And today we are going to present uh, the Alactia service that is tailored for the exploration of our galaxy, the Milky Way, with the visual analytics uh, techniques. And today our uh, first speaker is uh, Marco Molinaro from INAF. So I will now stop my sharing and let you uh, share your screen. So uh, here is an introduction to the Via Lactea knowledge base. That is, let's say, the resource for data and services for the uh, Via Lactea services hosted by Nianias. As I prepared these slides uh, with uh, Robert Butera, that is also here and is the main developer of the services themselves. I'm more, let's say, the service curator, the resource curator. I'll give you a quick historical overview of the VLKB to give some context of what I'll be talking about. So the Via Lactea knowledge base was initially designed for the Via Lactea project, a, a European Union of FP7 project, uh, whose title was actually the Milky Way as a star formation engine. And that was meant to provide data and services to the galactic uh, research community, trying to bridge catalog and data collection that were quite heterogeneous and sparse and distributed around the world, while the researchers wanted them in one, let's say, place and with a common way to access and, and discover them. After the project stopped, uh, the services and the data were maintained by the Italian, Italian National Institute for Astrophysics, Italian Center for Astronomical Archives, or IA2, uh, that also participated in the Via Lacta project, of course, so it continued to live there. But more recently, the, the VLKB has been kept alive thanks to the requirements and funding from a set of other projects. So one of them is, of course, Neanias. Uh, for which we created a partial, in terms of data, replica on the cloud um, provided by the GAR, that is the Italian NREN. Uh, also, for the scientific requirements, the VLKB is now uh, maintained or kept alive by the ECOGAL ERC, and the Italian, let's say, uh, it's called... Um, a project of National Institute for, for Italy, uh, CIRASA. And some work has also been used within the H2020 ESCAPE cluster projects for astrophysics and particle physics that is connected to the EOS cloud itself. And all of these services and resources that I'll try to describe in the next few minutes are growing and maturing over time, improving, based on new project uh, requirements, but also looking forward to see whether we can get some dedicated funding to improve IVOA and fair maturity of the services themselves, which is not bad. Their status is not bad currently, but it needs some resources to make them better. In terms of data collection, the VLKB hosts 11 different uh, band catalogs of compact sources. These catalogs, uh, contain from a few uh, thousands of rows to some tens of mega or so or millions of rows. Yes, Marco, sorry. I don't know if you changed the slide, I but the we slide, still but you see, see the first one. Resume share. Okay. Can you see the second one? Yes. Now, this now one. yes. Thank you. Okay. And so, as I was saying, there are 11 catalogs of compact sources from tens of kilo rows to tens of mega rows. Here I listed some of them. For example, the WISE catalog has something like 28 millions of records in it. Uh, there is also a catalog of combined, of combined spectral energy distributed uh, distribution of compact sources is roughly 2 million rows. Uh, a catalog of diffuse objects, uh, filamentary structures and bubbles, 
those are structured in multiple in four tables, not so many, but for example, the okay, the bubbles use only one table, one catalog table, the filaments are distributed in the sense that they describe differently the nodes, the branches, and the spines of the filaments available there. You can have a small representation on that on the top right uh, image where you can see the branches that are the contoured things. The nodes are actually the places where the branches get connected one to another and so on. Uh, there are also simulated data. There are 30, actually it's 20. I, oh, that's definitely a mistake. 20 million rows, but also more than 100 columns of spectral energy distribution simulated for compact objects. Uh, a table of, distance, of source distances in the galaxy with respect to our solar system has been computed in the past for some uh, roughly one hundred and a half uh, tens, thousands of rows. And in total, the metadata database uh, goes around 40 gigabyte, which created an issue when we tried to replicate everything on the cloud, because usually you cannot get a single machine with a dedicated disk for a database management system of that size. Um, besides the catalogs, there are also data sets, that means uh, um, images and cubes. There are roughly 39,000 or 40,000 uh, data sets there. Uh, most of them are cubes, but there are also images, and they are collected into different data collections, so 25 surveys. Each of them is usually multiple, so you have multiple um, spectral bandwidths taken into account in the same survey, and we, we describe them differently. And this sum up to roughly, well, it's nearly two terabyte of space. Not that much, but the heterogeneity uh, makes the difference here. Uh, and also the collection will be growing. Uh, so we are waiting possibly in the next year or so also to host some ALMA data that will definitely increase the, the size on the storage side. Uh, in terms of metadata, the metadata for these resources has been set up for various reasons. On one side, human researchers need to assess the value of the data for their research. But also we want machines, so uh, applications and services to act on top of the data contents directly without human intervention or re let's say minimizing human intervention and also metadata is of course really important in terms of data interoperability. Solutions and technology for the metadata uh, initially started following the custom requirements from the Via Lactea project, but I always leveraged and tried to follow the IVOA standardization and experience that I have to make them really interoperable. And this was also crucial in terms of creating interfaces that can be in the future interoperated. And the metadata maturity, of course, has been driven by project requirements, so it's slowly reaching robustness. That means that I'll try from time to time to improve the content of the metadata. Uh, on these two snapshots here, you'll see the list of the catalogs and the way that they are stored in the database through a table access protocol. I'll speak about that in a moment. While at the bottom right, uh, you see a partial list of the data collections, so the sub, the sub surveys that I was speaking about. So on top of these data resources, what services do run? Uh, we have uh, various APIs. One is for searching, that means filtering data sets, for example, in terms of position on the sky, on the galactic plane, actually, uh, in, or in terms of spectral or velocity, so the third axis for the cubes, or by collection details. That means what collection, what transition, what uh, species is involved in the uh, bandwidth transition. Then we have an interface to cut out that uses the same interface parameters as search, but of course they require a mandatory data set identifier to do the cut that is used to, let's say, uh, lower the request on bandwidth in the, in the data transfer. So to only uh, provide the client application or the user with exactly what they want without unloading or downloading 
uh, some, I don't know, sometimes nearly a gigabyte of data for, for, for while needing only a small region on the sky. Uh, there is also a merge solution that requires multiple data set identifiers using the same interface parameters. So you can have one sub-survey, multiple images or data cubes that are adjacent one to another, and you want to merge them because you are interested in something that is on the overlap or it, it's present part, partially on one or on the other side of your observational uh, data set. So this is this merge solution again the parameters are the same. And you can see on the uh, small table, well, it's not so small, on the table on the right, uh, on the lower right, what parameters are allowed in the, in the query, which ones are mandatory, which ones are optional, and the various combination of them, or some information on the values that are acceptable by these queries. While for the catalogs, we use a table access protocol, an IVOA standard for accessing it. Uh, we'll need, as I said, to improve from time to time the curation. And also we are lacking a proper cross-match solution to cross-match the compact sources that you can imagine roughly like a point like so plus a circle or, or an ellipse around it uh, with a diffuse object that is a more geometrical uh, complexity in it. And we have also a service to filter and access the simulated spectral energy distribution model that was initially based and is currently also available as a relational database uh, query interface and is under refurbishment because it, we need to speed it, speed him up because it takes really too long to uh, take back the various uh, models that you need to do interpolation on the actual observational data. Also for the data services, we went uh, through a process of going from customary things into more standardized and interoperable solutions. So the search solution as an obscore, so it's an observational core table access protocol standard from the IVOA. The table is there, it's not, it simply is not yet enabled, we'll have to do that. And because this obscore table will let us feed both the table access protocol and the so-called simple image access version two standard, that means that the services that you'll see are currently consumed a lot only by the visual analytics client can be exposed and made available to the full astronomical community through these standardized interfaces. For the cutout itself, there exists um, a standard in the IVOA that is called server-side operations for data access or SODA interface uh, that allows for synchronous or asynchronous cutouts. Uh, usually you use asynchronous ones when you have long uh, computation and long for researchers can be only 30 seconds. So usually you go asynchronous, so you don't have to lock your application waiting the response from the this REST interface. Uh, we'll go possibly through an async solution there, but it's possible to fake a sync solution over what is called here a UWS job that is a universal worker service description and other IBOA standard. And for the cutout, we are also uh, working towards a multi, a multiple cutouts in one query solution so that you can ask for multiple cutouts in various places on the, uh, on the galactic plane and get back a packaged solution with all the uh, successful cutout solutions. Uh, merge as not a proper standardization way in the IVOA. So we'll, we'll use what is called the data link custom service based on the universal worker service. And catalogs need to be, uh, sorry, a moment. And uh, needs, as I said, uh, we have a table access protocol. We'll have to change a bit the library there because the one that we're using is quite old and it doesn't allow a proper authentication and authorization solution and let's say smoothly. All of these um, services roughly are, are have authentication and authorization token based solution attached to two data providers, the NEANIAS provided one and the ENAF IA2 one. And 
And last part of my presentation is for what re uh, was required in a sense or what adjustment we made to the services that I just described to attach to the four technical services offered by the NIANIAS. You see them listed on the left side. So you have authentication and authorization described here. As I said, it's token-based based on OpenID Connect and Open and OAuth 2. Uh, this because the internal IA2 solution was not directly applicable to what was uh, needed by the NEANIAS AI, uh, because in, in this case, the solution is to have the virtual, the visual analytics client to manage the authentication and feed it to the service that then deals with authorization. All of this is based on access token. And the solution uh, for the authorization is having users and groups and the, gru the groups may um, keep the authorization uh, information and the authorization is applied directly to the data set so to the to the to the at the resource level for the logging part uh, a configuration has been done to have the file bit log harvester of the services and this is the list of the information that has been collected is currently collected for logging Similarly, the accounting has the same technology, so it only changes a bit on the information that has been collected here, namely uh, for the cutout and merge, the, the, the file size in megabyte. And while for the monitoring, we simply, well, uh, was simply use the remote plugin for Nagios and the Nagios configuration was uh, done so that resources like memory, load, and input output statistic, as well as connection has been taken into account. And that's uh, roughly it because all of these were since the beginning meant to be API consumable interfaces on top of the resources. So, uh, these are directly consumed by the visual analytics solutions that you'll see in the next presentations, actually, because also the third one will be related to this. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I, unless you have direct questions, I can directly stop sharing. Thank you, Marco. Maybe I propose to go to the next presentation and then at the end uh, we will uh, collect the questions uh, via chat or uh, if you want, you can uh, ask directly. So now it's the Giuseppe. I think you can share your screen and I hope we can hear you. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. And we can hear. Thank you. Good. So hello, everyone. I'm Giuseppe from the Catania Astrophysical Observatory, and I'm here to present you the VLACTE Visual Analytic, or VLVA. So VLVA is an open source software that uh, you can uh, download from, the, from, from GitHub. And it is the main tool that uh, allows you to interact with the VLKB in a transparent way, let's say. So uh, VLVA is available for, uh, for Linux and for macOS, and uh, we also provide you a Docker container that allows you to, to run the, the tool also on uh, unsupported platforms, such as, for example, Windows, if you, if you use it with the WSL, the Windows uh, subsystem for Linux. You can also get VLVA from the European Open Science, European Open Science Platform. Uh, this is the link where you can also where you can access the, the resource. So let's start with the, with the client. This is the first window that shows up when you open the client. So first we need to select which instance we want to use of the VLKB. There are actually two instances, one uh, the IA2 and one for the NAS. We also need to authenticate ourselves from the setting windows. Then we can start using the, the applications. We can start using the application. We can uh, load uh, local data using the, button, uh, the buttons on the top. Or we can also use this uh, interactive panoramic view of the galactic plane to 
make a selection. We can make a circular selection or a rectangular selection. And uh, we can send the search request to the VRKB and uh, get the results by clicking on the query button on the top. So the client will uh, fetch the coordinates in the region sites, will send the request to the VLKB. And once the request is, uh, is done, we get the results. And this is the, the image visualization, the 2D image visualization window. From here, we can also uh, we get also a list of, from the VLKB of related uh, cutouts. So that we can uh, add to our visualization. If we click on an item, we can see a footprint that shows the, the coverage of the selected item. And to, to download an item from this list, we can just uh, double click on it. Here we are, so we are making another request, another cutout request to the VKB to download this uh, spectral data cube. So the 3D visualization windows presents uh, the data cube visualization on the left side and the slice visualization on the right side. We can change the slice that we are visualizing by moving the slider on the top. We can also uh, change the visualization of the data cube by setting a threshold. We can uh, move the slider or type of a value on the text box under the, the slider. Here we have some uh, statistic of the data cube, such as minimum and maximum values for the data cube upon the slice. And we can also show the visualize the contours for the selected uh, slice. Now, what I'm showing you works better if you have a larger monitor or if you use multiple monitors. You can actually put uh, side by side the two windows, the to the visualization window and the data cube visualization window, where we can see the contours are also reported on the on the other windows. Back here, we can also uh, request from the VLKB another uh, image. In this case, the client will not open a new window, but the, the new image will appear as a layer on the top of the current visualized image. We can uh, change the layer stack by dragging the, the item. Um, we can also select which one we want to visualize. And uh, we have also some options that uh, can uh, change for the currently selected layers, such as the color palette, the opacity level, and the, the, the scale. We can choose between linear scale and the logarithmic scale. And there is no limit to the number of layers that you want to, to visualize. You just need to click on the items and it will uh, show on the layers list. So as uh, Marco said, we can contact the VLKB to get uh, the comeback sources using a search service. Here, the client makes it uh, very easy. We can just uh, select a region. We confirm the, uh, the region uh, coordinates, and then we can uh, click on OK. So here yeah, the client is making uh, the top request to the VLKB. And once the, the request is done, we get uh, the list for uh, the combat sources grouped by the uh, catalog. And uh, each uh, group is uh, identified by a color. We can also change it if we want, and we can uh, see select which one we want to visualize and, uh, by using the, the checkbox near the, the color. So here we can also uh, select a particular source and uh, request the spectral energy distribution by selecting and click on the SID button. Uh, the client will show about the spectral energy distribution plot in a new window. And from here, we can uh, make uh, we can uh, uh, execute a set fitting operation by clicking on the on the points from the plot 
we have uh, two kind of uh, set fitting operation. We have the theoretical one and the gray body. So we first uh, need to select the points. Then on the right side, we click on the type. And the gray body has two subtypes. And the uh, client will uh, propose the default parameters that we can just accept and uh, see the results on, both on the plot and also we can see the, the results in the table below. And we can also uh, search for filament extractions by using this another button, but the, the procedure is the same for the convex sources. They will be shown as a items on this uh, on this list and we can uh, see the branches the contour and if we double click on the color we can uh, update the color on this uh, color chooser uh, so now we are, will show you the integration with uh, with caesar caesar is another uh, many access services that will be presented in a, a webinar next week if we open the Caesar panel with the client, we will ask if we want to upload the image we are visualizing to uh, submit uh, a source extraction job. Once we have uh, uploaded the, the, the file, we will see it on this table. So for, uh, for submitting a job, we must select the file select which uh, source extraction we, we want to, to use. Each, uh, each one has its own input that we can uh, tune on the right side. And then we, if we want, we can also set a tag for this job operation, this is optional. And if we click on submit job, the uh, actor will send the job to Caesar and uh, it will uh, start right away and we can see the status on this uh, another table on this table on this uh, panel. So if we refresh how the job is running, we can also check the auto refresh uh, checkbox to re uh, refresh the, the table every 10 seconds. But uh, for example, if we want to download uh, an output, uh, we can just click on the jobs, click on the download output and uh, select where we want to download and uh, here we are downloading the job results from the Caesar services on our local machine. And we can uh, uh, see the contents and uh, work on it. Uh, now let's uh, assume we want to save the status of our uh, working session. We have done uh, quite a few things. So we can save the, the session on, uh, on uh, our local machine. We can uh, select an empty folder. And here we have the we have saved the sessions, and we can restore it later. For example, uh, from the from the starting window, we can click on File Load Session. We select the same folder that we have selected before, and this is a preview of what will be loaded. We can so check if we want to discard some uh, some files on the with the VKB, we can also avoid another search request to the VKB and just load the contents on our file system. And uh, the client will, uh, will load all the things that uh, as we left them before saving the, the session. And here it is. So uh, this was just a brief introduction to, to the client. If you wanna, and get it. You can download the, the packages from, from GitHub. And you can also check the user manual online at this uh, read the docs page. And if you do try the client, uh, please let us know what you think about it. If you may improve uh, some uh, user experience or uh, if we are missing some features that you, you wish to have on the client, uh, you can. Uh, you can send us your feedback by clicking on this link on the, on the client. It will uh, open a browser with a simple form, and, uh, and that's basically it. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer after.
the next uh, presentation that will show uh, another client by Eugenia. Uh, so I'm stopping the screen sharing now. Yes, thank you, Giuseppe. Now, if uh, Eugenia can uh, share her screen. So thanks to the collaboration with the University of Portsmouth, uh, we have uh, developed a simplified web version of the Vialacte Visual Analytic Client, and Eugenia will present the details. So Eugenia, we can see your screen, but we cannot hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, you okay, can thank you. Yes, yes, thank you, Eugenia. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Giuseppe. Uh, well, the Alacte Web project uh, brings uh, the Alacte Visual Analytics functionality into the web environment. So uh, the basic idea is that it splits between server and client the most heavy computational visualization part and lightweight user interaction. Such client-server oriented architecture uh, provides a benefit of flexibility of future extension and allow easy access via different platforms such as mobile and desktop. But at the same time, uh, the developer has to practically address the aspects of authorization uh, based on server visualization processes, scaling for further multi user support uh, here. Uh, as a result, the key uh, components of uh, the Alactia verb are presented on this slide. The client server communication protocols involve web sockets. Uh, here we have used a particular sub protocol called BUMP and REST interfaces for handling the binary stream of images, data, and direction JSON and XML formats for asynchronous data pooling stuff. Uh, then Node.js is, uh, is often used and this here was used as well uh, as a base for our client implementation. Uh, on the server side, uh, we have uh, an upper coding lawyer for CPU and GPU deployment uh, that's provided for appropriate uh, scripting bindings that is Python in this case. The server handles all the heavy remote visualization processes and rendering stuff. Uh, the the multi-user operation scenarios for remote visualization are supported with proxy server a patch that provides all the forwarding for the specific client and user authentication models. Also, there is a separate model that launches each uh, separate visualization process on server for each user and provides the identification, its identification data to Apache to enable further forwarding establishing. Uh, remote visualization communicates uh, with the VLKB database to extract all the knowledge about uh, the astrophysics uh, data and to perform visualization process based on this uh, data obtained. So let me provide you with a quick uh, demo of how this entire system works. So first we access the services. We have to authorize. Then uh, we, similar to Vialactia, visual analytics have to enter, make a query. By default, some first uh, image uh, is uh, visualized, but here you can see all the other data is pulled that includes uh, 2D images and 3D data cubes. Each query, each 3D data cube is opened in a separate multi-tap window, a separate browser window, where you can do the same stuff as you can do with the VL. VA, uh, that's cutting planes, adjusting threshold values. So you can open many uh, as many data as you like. They, each one of them will be opened in a separate window. And uh, 
you can work with them simultaneously uh, by creating different browser tabs. This is shown here. Place it and how you like. Also, there is a possibility to load uh, some uh, local data stored in the server, some local kids files separately. Those uh, separate data cubes, you can perform the same operations with them, similar to the data cubes from VLK. VLK. And we also provide a possibility, depending on the different image layers, to adjust their optical features to their palette, visibility issues, or change their order, similar to the Alactia knowledge base. So uh, the services are access, uh, can be accessed via uh, INAP uh, server. The, the instance is based uh, on the URL presented above. Uh, we also have the Docker version uh, that's uh, in a process that will be available and that will allow uh, uh, to run these uh, services within a Docker or within a Kubernetes engine. Uh, the source code are presented below. So uh, one thing is to remember about uh, using uh, the Alactive Web Services is that uh, access uh, to the, uh, the Alactive Services to VLKB mainly is required. So if you are will be playing with the Docker version separately, uh, you should uh, either register your service with the uh, uh, register your service uh, with the NIANI SSOs, or you should only use these um, local uh, data, local FITS files, uh, visualization of local FITS files, not directly to uh, play with the LKB. So here is um, the main thing to remember. So that's, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much, Eugenia, and thanks to all the speakers today. So thanks to Marco and Giuseppe. Uh, so now it's time for uh, some questions. If you have, just uh, raise your hand or write on the chat. And, uh, we will be happy to answer. Maybe if no questions. Uh, hello. Um, oh yes, Sebastian. Hello. Um, hello. Uh, very nice uh, uh, presentation today. Thank you very much. Um, I had a couple of questions in terms of uh, the usage of the services um, and and how long have they been running? Uh, I mean, operated in in production. Do you do you have uh, those numbers more or less? Maybe Marco, you have more uh, regarding the VLKB services. Uh, well, the, the VLKB services themselves are running since uh, some eight years. I think it's eight years. Yeah. It was the VLACT. Not, not always the same version, not always on the same server with data that has grown up in the meantime, that the services that have been bug fixed in some places and replaced in other ones. But yeah, they've been usually continuously up. And the nice thing and the, the unexpected one is that in the, let's say, maintenance uh, phase, so when the Via Lactea initially stopped up to when we restarted with ECOGAL and NEANIAS uh, more recently, uh, maybe the services were not that much used, but they were used because a couple of times we had some overload on the servers, uh, but still they were working. Uh, this is not because we are the greatest developers or service providers in the world, but I think it's more on the way that they've been designed to be really 
on standards based. So you really have back compatibility as a automatic, uh, as something that you gain roughly, not zero effort, but nearly there. Uh, users are not that many, I would say. Uh, it, it was more in the past when, and it would be, I suppose, in the future also, continue with ECOGAL in bursts. So something like tens of thousands of requests for cutouts because someone wants to do some big statistics on the data sets. Uh, but otherwise, some uh, spotty solution where people play, and mainly because of the visual analytics clients that are there. Right. Okay. I guess that that's for the uh, because the, the services can be deployed um, elsewhere, right? So, uh, so you, you are basically uh, counting the the usage on, on the deployment you manage, uh, uh, or, or can can it be self hosted somewhere else? To the, the problem with replicating exactly the VLKB around that could be nice because there are other big databases around the world in astrophysics that do that is that even if not tremendously large, it's difficult to have the full replica with the two terabytes and the 40 gigabyte database from one place to another, because you cannot uh, really run the cutout service on one server and have the cube coming from a different distributed places geographically. Uh, because even if the network is fast, the, the, the time you wait for the cube to get there and be cut is really something that you, you have to avoid. You have to have the computation of top of the data in these cases. So if you want to replicate the VLKB, you have to replicate the full environment. Uh, even for the Anianias one, we sort of have a trick for the database because we have a tunnel that goes from the cloud server to our database solution here self-hosted one. If we can solve that in the future, then we can have a VLKB similar to what uh, astrophysical resources like uh, Vizier does, because Vizier opens up as a unique web server, but actually there are mirrors around the world, so you connect to the closest to you. Okay, thanks, very interesting. Thank you. Any other question? I suppose uh, no. So in this case, uh, I thank again all the speakers uh, and I thank all the attendees. And uh, we see for the next uh, webinar that will be 15th of June. So thank you and see you soon. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye, you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.